Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Very interesting things uh, we're going to be speaking about this evening. And uh, we have just got back in only a couple hours ago from Austria there. So we're running a little bit behind uh, and trying to do the research that I've been wanting to do on this issue here uh, in regards to the document that, uh, that we have uh, shared with you yesterday, the Orthodox Rabbinic Statement on Christianity. Uh, December the 3rd, 2015, that just came out, uh, that the rabbis, quite a few rabbis, I would say probably roughly around 30 rabbis, 14 rabbis on the first signatorial of this document here from Israel, and, uh, and a number uh, also from, uh, of course, many of them from all over the different parts of the world that have come on uh, board with the document to uh, to, to, make the, to make a oneness with the relationship between the Vatican and Israel. Uh, and, but the funny thing is, they're calling this, though, a, 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 recon, a reconciliation. You know, Brother Kellen Davison did the Reconciliation with Israel conference uh, back in September. And, uh, but yet, all the while, Brother Kellen's intentions, of course, are the purest and the best there to bring together the, the true Christians that stand with Israel, uh, not the Vatican thugs that are just really out there to uh, take over the country in the first place. And we're going to be doing much deeper research on this, along with all the rabbis that have actually signed on to this document. I did get a little bit of time to look into some of these rabbis. Very interesting indeed. And some other things that I've stumbled across along the way that are very shocking to say the least. In fact, the mere fact that right now we have Rabbi uh, Yosef, which is the taller of the gentleman on your screen there in the background, the shorter rabbi there uh, uh, with the kind of like a little turban hat on, is Rabbi Lau, uh, who is of the Sephardic community, Rabbi uh, Yosef of the Ashkenazi. And this is way, the way that the British mandate before the creation of the State of Israel had set up the way the rabbinic uh, leadership would be in Israel. You might wonder, what do you mean they set it up, the British mandate? Well, if we go back, and, and we're looking into the historical side of all this right now, so it's very interesting to say the least, but we, we stumbled across a book here when we were searching different rabbis' names that have signed on to this agreement here. David, Rabbi David Broadman was one of those rabbis there, and he was featured in a, in a very interesting book called The Catholic Church and the Jewish People, Recent Reflections from Rome. Uh, it's by Philip Cunningham and uh, Norbert uh, uh, Joan, Joans Lofman and Joseph uh, Sievers. All these, th this is nothing but a Catholic book to begin with, but interesting, in the very page where it speaks about Rabbi David Broadman here, and of course they're speaking about how he's come together to help unify the the, uh, the church's relationship with Israel. In fact, all these rabbis have had some type of uh, influence in this in, in the past. And I've seen thus far, I've seen going back 10 years, they've been working with the Vatican to establish these relationships. Well, no doubt, Shimon Perez started back in 1993 with Pope John Paul II. And, and it goes on and on and on and on. But in the book here, it states here, the chief rabbinate, as, as the highest authority, dates back to the Ottoman Empire. The chief rabbi, Sephardic, back then, functioned as the spokesperson for the Jewish community to the sultan. Wow, he actually had to answer to someone, didn't he? It's not, not much different today, especially since we find out the next part. Functioned as the spokesperson for the Jewish community to the sultan. The structure of the chief rabbinate made up of a council of two chief rabbis. Really, they should have put on there as of today. Um, one Sephardic and one Ashkenazi was established under the British mandate before the founding of the state of Israel. You're kidding me. So, even Israel's religious order is being dictated by the British mandate. The League of Nations, we might say. The Vatican's first endeavor to unify the nations. Now, don't get anything wrong, friends. We do know biblical prophecy promised to return the house of Judah to their homeland. The, the Israel will go back to their homeland. There's no doubt about it. In fact, in Isaiah 2, which is the very vision that they are trying to marry right now, uh, let's just hit that before I go into Psalm here, the, the book of Psalms for you. We need to just, let's just, let's just start 
laying things down and putting things in order right from the beginning here. Isaiah chapter 2 here. What do we have here? This is the vision they're trying to marry. The world that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as, at, as the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is the vision, my friends, that the lawless of Israel are trying to marry. Now, you that may be just joining this news broadcast for your first time. It is a prophetic broadcast tonight. When we say prophetic, that doesn't mean we are prophesying. We're only looking at the prophecies of the Bible and how they relate to current news events. And that current news event right now that we're talking about is none other than the document signed by the rabbis recently here, the Orthodox Rabbinic Statement on Christianity. And by the way, the Catholic Church has jumped on this and publicizing it everywhere. But let me just tell you something, friends. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't worry about this. The Catholic Church is the one that's been behind getting this all going to begin with. This, this is nothing new. They've known this for a long time time that this was coming. This was the original signatories of the rabbis on there. Rabbi Aaron's uh, Angel, Asil, Bigman, Bolgan, Brodman, uh, Lopez Cardoza, uh, Yehuda Gillen, Goshen, Greenberg, Raphael uh, Gudia, Korn, Landis, Lagnas, Lau, Livson. Now that's not Rabbi Lau that, was, that is the chief rabbi, Benjamin Lau. I don't know if this, they're related or what, whatever, but... Um, the chief rabbi of Finland, Livson, Lopten, Rishkin, Rosen, Rothenberg, Sch Schischlinger, Surat, France, Sperber, Wolberg, and uh, Uter. Uh, these are the, the initial signatories, and I'll be taking you into other things a little bit later uh, as we go there. But as we were looking here, let me take you to Daniel chapter 11, and this is for those that are new to what's going on and maybe just joined us. Uh, and we are going to dig this out much deeper in the days coming, friends. Just bear with me. I'm hoping tomorrow evening to take you a lot deeper into this uh, to start with. Um, but anyway, uh, let's take, let's bring you down to, uh, this is in Daniel 11. And we're looking at verse 14. It is a prophecy. And especially the latter half of the verse here. Is what we want to look at. It says, In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. Now, literally, in Hebrew, it, it's worded a little different, but they, they worded it here so it would make sense to you. Uh, of course, you could, you could change the word violent for robbers. Lawless is really what it's saying in Hebrew. Uh, so it says, Also, the children of the violent are the children of the lawless, and, of course, the angel is speaking to Daniel. So he says, um, uh, uh, the, the, let's see, the, uh, among thy people, so that thy people is Daniel's people, so it are, they are Jews. Now, in Hebrew it says, Uvane porotzi amcha, literally, this, and the sons of the lawless of your people, Daniel. The lawless ones. In other words, it don't, I don't care if they say they're keeping Torah. They're not keeping the true words of Almighty God. They're not keeping those Ten Commandments that God brought down to Israel. All right? But it says, the sons of the lawless ones, inasu, they will try to marry. They're going to try to marry the vision. All right, what are they doing? They're trying to marry the vision. They're trying to, the, the sons of the lawless, they're wanting to bring God's word to pass. That vision they're trying to marry is Isaiah chapter 2. I just showed you. They're trying to make it, they're trying to make Jerusalem an international city where all the people of the nations are going to flow into there. Have they ever thought that maybe this might be a millennial reign issue that we're talking about and not something that will happen uh, in, in this life? No, they don't look at it like that. They believe that this is going to 
to happen right now in the very near future and they're trying to bring together an international community in order to make it happen that's why it says but they shall stumble or they shall fall in Hebrew see this is what's going to happen they're going to fall they will not be successful because they're the lawless ones Actually, God will raise up the two witnesses that will cause this whole vision to crumble in the first place. And this is really what's going to happen uh, out of this whole uh, charade that we're seeing right now there. So at any rate there, though, let, let's drop back here real quick here. Just to let you see these two um, uh, chief rabbis of Israel, they are united with the Pope of Rome there. And many rabbis, believe me, there's many rabbis in Israel that are not united with the Pope of Rome. They do not want idolatry. And I might say to those Jewish brothers and sisters that will be watching, as well as the Christians that are not united with Rome uh, this evening, that are not part of the Kenneth Copeland group, not part of the John Hagee group, uh, that have signed on with the Vatican, uh, let me let you, uh, in fact, you know, I mentioned John Hagee, and, and, and I get every so often uh, people asking me, you know, Steve, I, you're saying John Hagee um, uh, is part uh, 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 with, with, with the Vatican, um, that he's actually with them? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. All right, and people have asked me many times, I, I can't believe this is so. Well, right here on the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights is Pastor Hagee's, Donahue Hagee's, his letter of apology. In a letter to Bill Don, excuse me, not Donahue, Pastor Hagee, in a letter to Bill Donahue, who is, who is the head of the, uh, the Catholic League here, uh, Pastor Hagee writes this letter of apology. All right, all you have to do is click on it, and they actually have published John Hagee's letter right here on May 12th of 2008. Catholic League for Civil and Religious Rights, attention Mr. William Donahue, President. Dear Mr. Donahue, in, in so far as some of my past statements regarding the Roman Catholic Church have raised concerns in your community, I am writing in a spirit of mutual respect and reconciliation to clarify my views. Reconciliation? You see, this is what the rabbis are doing. See, first, the Pope also, not only was he establishing reconciliation with the Jewish rabbis, also with the Muslims, but he was working on the evangelicals as well. He didn't have too hard of a time with some of them. They were already part of Rome anyway, like, like Rick Warren, who's really sucks up to the Pope more than anybody. But John Hagee has a huge ministry in Israel. So the Pope of Rome began to target those that have big evangelical ministries there in order to get them on his side there. It says, out of a desire to advance greater unity among Catholics and evangelicals and promoting the common good, I want to express my deep regret for any comments that Catholics have found hurtful after engaging in constructive dialogue with the Catholic friends and the leaders. I know, I now, excuse me, I now have an improved understanding of the Catholic Church, its relationship to the Jewish faith, and the his, history of, of anti-Catholicism. Now, for those of you that may not be able to see John Hagee's letter very well, and believe me, I have had a lot of respect for Pastor Hagee and his stance over the years telling the truth about the Catholic Church. And it has been very disheartening for me to see that Pastor Hagee caved in under whether it be political pressure, whatever the case may be, but he, he caved in. And no doubt they had a lot over his head, to say the least there. But that's what I'm just reading, what you're seeing on your screen right now. He says, In my zeal to oppose anti-Semitism and bigotry in its ugliest forms, I have often emphasized the darkest chapters in the history of the Catholic and Protestant relationships with the Jews. In the process, I may have contributed to the mistaken impression that the anti-Jewish violence of the Crusades and the Inquisition defines the Catholic Church. It most certainly does not, he states. Likewise, I have not sufficiently expressed my deep appreciation for the the efforts of the Catholics who opposed the persecution of the Jewish people. It is important to note that there were thousands of righteous Catholics, both clergy and laymen, who risked their lives to save Jews from the Holocaust, according to many scholars, including historian Martin Gilbert and Rabbi David Dahlin. All right. Um, 
He goes on to say, Pope Pius XII personally intervened to save Jews. He only did that to save face. Because he backed Hitler all the way. But you, you can read the letter for yourself, and I need to post the letter myself somewhere so you guys can get a hold of this. But this is Pastor Hagee's own letter of apology to the Roman Catholic Church. They're bringing back in their daughters, back into Rome. For my Jewish brethren that may not understand that, that's over in the book of Revelation. You see, she is the mother of, uh, of harlots. And John Hagee knows that she is, the Catholic Church is, the great whore of Revelation. Yes, she is. And, uh, and I just pray that Pastor Hagee will come back to a sense one day and straighten this all out and get back on the right path. God bless him for the stance he took in the past and, and so sad to see that he fell away from it afterwards. All right, but continuing on here, uh, what is going on, though, in modern times here? We have seen in Psalm 83, uh, one of the, the great tragedies of today is that Psalm 83, that there is an alliance that's being made by Esau. Remember, in the letter that has been written by these men here, uh, the Jewish rabbis here, they make a very interesting statement here in section 4. All right. They say they have claimed to the, to the benefit of all the duties, not only of justice, but also of active human brotherly love. In the past, relationships between Christians and Jews were often seen through, the, through adversarial relationships of Esau and Jacob. Yet Rab, Rabbi Naphtali V. Berlini uh, Netzev already understood at the end of the 19th century that Jews and Christians are destined by God to be loving partners. What? Loving partners? Did you not just hear what I read to you a few moments ago from Daniel 11? When I corrected the translation for you there where it says they shall marry the vision? You have to see, see friends, this is, the, this is a case of a repeat in history. As Ahab married Jezebel and brought idolatry into Israel, so today these rabbis are marrying again Jezebel, which is none other than the Roman Catholic Church, and bringing idolatry into Israel. Now, actually, it's kind of funny. It's like Jezebel is trying to get Ahab this time around here. So it was a Catholic Church that marries Ahab this time. They married Israel. They did it in order to create the state to begin with, and they'd set up who's going to be the boss and who's going, to, who's going to say what and do it when and how and everything else. Oh my gosh. Anyway, God to be loving partners in the future when the children of Esau are moved by pure spirit to recognize the people of Israel and their virtues, then we will also be moved to recognize that Esau is our brother. I, I mean... Has anybody forgot that what Malachi said? Have you guys really forgot? Let, let me take you what Malachi says. I, eventually we're going to get back over here to Psalm. I promise we're going to get back to Psalm. But let me, let's, let's just go look for those brethren uh, in Israel that don't seem to remember the prophet Malachi and what prophet Malachi said. He says here, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob? But Esau I hated, and made his mountains a desolation, and gave his heritage to jackals of the wilderness. Whereas Adam saith, we are beaten down, but we will return and build the waste places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall be called the border of wickedness, and the people whom the Lord uh, excradeth forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is great beyond the border of Israel. You see, when we look back at the story of Jacob and Esau, what did, what did, what did, you know, for, for a morsel of meat, so to speak, and it was, it was a bowl of pottage, it was actually for one little morsel of food, Esau sells out his birthright to his brother Jacob. Jacob got it. But let me tell you something, friends. When in the modern days today, the Roman Catholic Church in Nicaea 325, they sold their birthright as well. And they sold it for the exact same thing that Esau did. They could have been the true church that would have led all the way down through the ages. 
But even in the humane gospel, Yeshua spoke about what you would do. That there would be wicked men that would come along, pervert the words of Yeshua. You sold, you did, you sold your birthright, Catholic Church. You sold it out also for a piece of meat. Sacrifice to idols. In fact, you even aligned yourself with the Mithras religion of Constantine's day. Even Constantine regretted later in his life that this ever happened. He regretted what, what happened to Eusebius. Eusebius told what the true believers believed about in the beginning there. But you took and sold your birthright, altered the word of God. Just like, no wonder why God doesn't forgive Esau. For those of you that don't know who Esau is, you're going to find out in just a few moments. This is something we'll deal with in this news broadcast here. All right? So see, I'm just reminding my Jewish brethren here, God is not going to pardon Esau. Because Esau is not, Esau is Rome today. All right? It, it is the spirit of Esau, but it's literally, it's physically Esau as well. Hadad was the one sole heir of Esau. The royal line of Esau was Hadad that escaped the sword of David, goes down into Egypt, raised by the Pharaoh of Egypt. When he becomes a man, the Pharaoh gives him his wife's sister to marry. Then he wants to, be, then he wants to take it and go back to his people. He doesn't go to Edom. He goes to Syria, becomes the king of Syria later. There were some decent kings in Syria. I'm not saying that they weren't. But the whole point is, is Hadad, though, he brought, the, he brought the Egyptian religion up into Syria, married there, and then later migrated up into Rome, northern Africa, and then over into Rome. The Jewish Jews actually followed his lineage. And we have several books in the Bible that clearly identify that it is that Daniel is one when he speaks about that prince that shall come will be of the people that destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Titus was a Roman general that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. All right, and the prince that shall come, a Pontifus Maximus, is of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Now, some say, well, that was the Syrians. It wasn't Titus. Titus gave the orders. Why do you think they have the Ark of Titus there in Israel? The reason they got the Ark of Titus there is, is to commemorate the destruction of the, of the second temple. And they carried away all the treasures. Obadiah clearly identifies the Romans for doing this. And he even does say that you stood aloof while your brother was ransacked, murdered, pillaged, and raped, the women raped, and everything else. Yes, Obadiah does tell us who you are. The Roman Catholic Church of today are the descendants of Esau. Now, that doesn't mean all that the Catholic people that are there. He does say to you, and he says, that this is actually a prophecy to Israel in Revelation 18, 4, and it's also as well, it's in the, it's in the Torah as well, uh, or, the, or the Old Testament, I should say, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sin. That's Revelation 18, 4. That's both Jew and Christian alike. Catholic people that are part of it, come out of it. He says to Israel, though, come out of it, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins and her plagues. Because why? God is going to pour the plagues out on Esau. All right? Now, let's jump back over here then to, as I was going to get you over here into Psalm 83. Psalm 83 is important because we're going to learn a little bit about what Esau does there. He says, For lo, thine enemies, verse 3, are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. That's their leader. They hold crafty converse or counsel against thy people, that's Israel, and take counsel against thy treasured ones. Sufanecha, Sufanti, or Sufon, is the root word right here in Hebrew on your screen. That word means uh, hidden, not treasured. You can use treasured, but the more correct way is it, like the famous uh, song that we have in Israel, uh, uh, um, See, it's the hidden ones. Your hidden ones is what he says here. That's the two witnesses. 
So they hold a crafty uh, council against thy people. Even this has been a plot and plan, Israel, against you. This whole thing that they're doing right now, this wonderful little document that they got going on with a bunch of rabbis that are nothing but a bunch of backslidden rabbis to begin with. Rabbis, you have a chance to get out of this mess too. Repent is what you need to do. Maybe you ought to listen to that little boy named Nathan that came out. People say he's crazy. The people that are saying it are the ones that are crazy. That young man, God used that young man. He may not have said something that you liked, or, or maybe the Messianic movement hates what he had to say. But I guarantee you one thing, how'd that little boy know there was going to be two witnesses going to be laying dead on the mountain there to raise up just before the coming of the Lord? No, nobody knew about that, did they? Mm. Anyway, they, counsel, they, they, they take counsel against the hidden ones. Why? Because they know the two witnesses are coming. That's going to cause them a problem. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Well, rabbis, you didn't know that, did you? Or maybe you do know it. For they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do, uh, against thee. do they make a covenant, the tents of Edom, Adam, what do you know? Adam's involved in this. Esau's children. The tents of Adam. The churches. And the Ishmaelites, Moab, and the Hagarites. This is these Arabic countries all around Israel. What is this, what is this confederacy to begin with? This confederacy that Rome has been doing is they're going to take, because they're trying to manufacture a millennial reign on earth. And they're trying to marry the vision with a bunch of backslidden, lawless Israelites. And because things are not going to go the way they planned, they're also, they've already made a covenant with all the Arab nations around there, and they're going to bring them against you very soon to bring a war in Israel to, 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 to cause you to bend the knee and to bow to what their demands are. You know, this whole thing of the Intifada is started by the Vatican. The Vatican's own chief spokesman said there will not be peace in Jerusalem until you hand over, uh, give us the autonomy over all of our holy sites. That's a, that's a flat out threat, friends. That's a threat. All right, but Israel don't seem to realize that. Instead, you go out and sign agreements with them instead. See, you've got to remember, the Vatican has other people doing the dirty work. Right now, he's got, he's got the, uh, the, the, the radical Palestinians, because not all Palestinians are bad people. Please don't mis misunderstand that. There's many good Palestinian people that love the Lord. There's many Christian Palestinian people, many Catholic ones as well, and no doubt they're a part of the radical movement. But I will tell you one thing. The radical ones there are only diverting the attention of the Israeli military to keep them in all places that you could ever imagine to weaken the borders. Why what? Hezbollah will begin to attack. Why, why does Israel keep... I mean, I realize that the Israeli government attacks certain people that they feel like is a threat to the country, like some of these real, uh, leaders and things, but is there something going on inside the government there that's only provoking Hezbollah? And before you know it, Hamas will attack. They're going to attack in a, in, a, in, a, in a coordinated effort. And I think they're doing it intentionally. I think this is what Psalm 83 is all about. Psalm 83 is not a war. Psalm 83 is a confederacy. And then there's going to be a war that follows it. Just like we see in Micah chapter 4 as well. All right? So anyway, we'll skip on past this, though, to save time. I want to I take you, though, real quick to also to Ezekiel. All right, we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 35 is where we're going to go to. So you can kind of get an idea of just what Esau is up to, friends. All right, let's drop down to verse 7 here. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate. Maybe we need to back up. Uh, verse 5, because thou hast had a hatred of old and hast, ooh, ooh, let's back up even more. Verse 3, and say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the old Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. He's talking about Adam. 
to Esau's descendants. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast had a hatred of old, and hast hurled the children of Israel into the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of the, iniqu uh, the, time of the iniquity of the end. God's blaming Esau once again, which is none other than Rome. Obadiah, you'll see it in a moment. Obadiah is where Esau identifies who they are. It's the Roman Catholic Church of today. But he says you threw them, threw them to the sword when the, the time that their iniquity had an end. Now, is that speaking back during the times when Yeshua came on the earth, or is it speaking of the times today? Because Daniel speaks about the iniquity coming to an end as well. And it seems to be in the 70th week of Daniel that that happens. So I'm thinking it's today. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Surely thou hast hated thine own blood, therefore blood shall pursue thee. Because why? Jacob. He hates his brother Jacob. He hates Israel to this day. Thus will I make Malsier most desolate and cut off from it, from it him that passeth through and him that returneth. He's talking about all the dignitaries that go in and out of the Vatican there. And I will fill his mountains with his slain, and thy hills, and the valleys, and all thy streams shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy city shall not return. And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine. What two? Israel and Palestine. The Palestinian Authority, where they've already made it into two states, now they're calling on them to negotiate. The Vatican's already called them two states. But he says right here, he said, these two nations, these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. He's talking about Israel. He's coming, he's coming to take your land, friends. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I shall judge thee. God's going to reveal himself to Israel as soon as he judges you. And thou shalt know that the Lord have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to devour. I guess that's going to be the war you bring up against them, huh? And you have magnified yourself against me with your mouth and have multiplied your words against me. I've heard it. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so I will do unto thee, thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edom. There you know, now you know who Mount Seir is. It's Edom, Esau, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When? When the earth rejoices. You know when the earth rejoices? I'll, I'll share that with you. I'll share that one with you as well. You may not be able to see it so well here because I don't have much of a way to, to make... Um, I don't have any way to actually cause this particular screen here to get larger that I'm aware of. This here is in the Christian Bible for the, my Jewish brothers that might be following along here. Revelation chapter 11. This is after the two witnesses have been killed and then their bodies are going to be raised up. But it says here in verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street, great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And verse 11, And after three days and a half the Spirit of God from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come uh, un, uh, unto, uh, saying unto them, Come up hither. See, when does the earth rejoice? During that three and a half days when these two witnesses are laying dead in the street. Nathan saw them laying dead, and what did he see in the vision that he saw? He saw Israel get attacked, didn't he? He saw a war going on. That's when Rome's going to be destroyed as well. All right, so let's just give you a little insight right there. Now, 
Let me take you one more, and that's for those of you that don't understand Esau, so we'll just make sure we make it clear here before we close our little broadcast here for this evening. Obadiah. This is the key of all of this right here is Obadiah. Verse 6, How is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? All the men of thy confederacy have conducted thee to the border. Remember Psalm 83, they're confederate together. The men that were at peace with thee have beguiled thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread lay a snare unto thee in whom there is no discernment. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and the discernment out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed in the end that every one may be cut off from the mount of Esau by slaughter. For the violence done to thy brother Jacob shall shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In that day thou didst stand aloof in the day that strangers carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast one of them, but thou shouldest not have gazed on the day of thy brother in the day of his disaster. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have, re have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Titus the Roman general, now you know who Esau is. Clearly identified here in the book of Obadiah. If you drop all the way down, of course I shared with you the other day, verse 16, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, the Pope of Rome recently, that's exactly what they did. They drunk upon the holy mountain anyway, right the there. Pope Francis actually fulfilled that passage there. When it says, Kika asha shutetem, see? For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, masculine plural. Then it goes, Al ha kodeshi. Well, that's al upon my holy mountain right there, sorry. Isha tu kol ha goim. And they shall continue, all the Gentiles will continually drink. Tamid, Tamid is, the, you know, they will continually drink there. See, that's, the, that's, that's gender inclusive in the plural. And they continue to drink on the holy mountain of God. And it is Mount Zion, but in the Mount Zion there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy. And in the house of Jacob shall possess all their possessions. You know, and then again we see again Esau mentioned here. Joseph of flame in the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall be as be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. And you think you're going to make a covenant with Esau? Verse 19, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the lowland, and the Philistines, and they shall possess the field of Ephraim, and the field of Samaria, and the Benjamin shall possess Gilead. Notice what it says in verse 21, the closing of it. And saviors, or deliverers in this case here, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. No wonder why they consulted against thy hidden ones in Psalm 83. The two witnesses, as they're mentioned right here in Obadiah, verse 21, will come up to judge the Mount of Esau. And they're going to come up on Mount Zion to do it. Very fascinating, to say the least. Friends, I just wanted to give you a little peek into this. Uh, and I'll continue to work on this to get more information put together for you. A lot of things are happening in and around the world. Very serious things indeed. And uh, so we'll be trying to gather more information as it comes available. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening.